12 defining truths about life. Now, I'm gonna go back through the others that I've already given you. Number one, you are not what you do. You are not what you do. Truth number two, living outside of the Father's house will make you a slave to that system. It'll make you a slave to that system. Number three, repentance requires getting up. You're going to repent, you gotta get up to do it. You gotta make a move. Number four, no matter how far you've gone, God is still your daddy. No matter how far you've gone, God is still your daddy. Defining truth number five, take care of the root and God will take care of the fruit. I wanna say that again. Take care of the root and God will take care of the fruit. Now let me stop, I wanna expound on that in just a second. This is the only one I wanna expound on that we've already dealt with. Here's the thing, everything begins with the root system. And I wanna reiterate what I said when I preach this. Getting to the root, working with the root, causes you to have to get down where you don't normally stand. You gotta get down on your hands and knees. Dealing with the root, get your hands dirty. You got, sometimes you gotta get down there and waller in the dirt to get the roots right. Amen? Sometimes you gotta get down there with them. You gotta help them. Because a good root system won't ask anything else until the fruit shows up. When the, when the fruit shows up, it'll be because the root system has been taken care of. So if we'll take care of the root, God will take care of the fruit. Amen? Number six, don't ever, don't ever boost your failure above God's grace. And, and I wanna seal that with this. You're not that good and you're not that bad. Don't ever boost your failure above God's grace. Number seven, forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't change God's mind about you. It changes your mind about you, right? Forgiveness doesn't change God's mind about you. It changes your mind about you. Number eight, you have more in your future than you've wasted in your past. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. You, you've got more in your future than you've wasted in your past. And number nine is this, you have to talk yourself up and out of the pig pen. You gotta talk yourself up and out. Amen? Amen, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. God, thank you for the rain. We've been praying for it. God, we've asked you for the rain and you've delivered it to, the, to us this weekend. And we're so thankful, God, that we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're in our presence and you walk with us. God, you didn't just show up at church this morning. You rode in the vehicle with us. You got up with us this morning, Lord. You, you were there last night when we were sleeping. So Lord, we thank you for your presence and your love and your joy. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we're so appreciative that you loved us when we were unlovable. And when we didn't love you, you still loved us. Your word says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation and your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. I'm gonna give you the last three defining truths about life this morning. Number 10, write this down. Grace doesn't empower you to sin, it empowers you to overcome sin. Grace doesn't empower you to sin, it empowers you to overcome sin. It's, it's not recorded anywhere in the scripture, anywhere in this, this story about the prodigal son that, that we have to rename him now. We can't call him the prodigal son anymore because being a prodigal was what he did, right? So we've got to look at it a different way. We've got to see it as, as, as the way God sees him, and that's just the way it's got to be. Now, it doesn't record anywhere in the scripture that this younger son ever left his father's house again. Doesn't say that anywhere in the Word of God. This tells us something. This really lets us know, it enlightens us to the knowledge that being secure in a relationship and having fellowship in that relationship 
produces strength over weakness. It causes us to be stronger than the weaknesses that we see. Some people say this, if you preach too much grace, it'll cause people to sin. Well, I have seen that in several different areas. I've also seen that when we preach not enough grace, that we cause people to fail because they didn't know that they could live in grace. And they thought that because they had a failure that God was done with them. Now, I want to tell you this morning, that's not true. But if I preach too much grace, it's not going to cause people to sin. And I'm going to give you an example. That'd be like me telling my wife or my wife telling me to stop telling her I loved her. Uh, that would be like her saying, don't, don't compliment me anymore. Don't tell me that I'm pretty. Don't tell, you, tell me you like my hair. Don't tell me you like my clothes. Don't, don't say anything good about me. Don't, don't say you don't like my cooking. The, just, just stop telling me all those things. I don't want to hear it. I don't enjoy it. I don't like that. And, uh, and, and just stop talking to me on, on the good things. Don't take me on any more trips. Don't surprise me with any good gifts. Don't do any of those things. How many of you men do those things for your wives? None of y'all? None of y'all do anything for your wives? If you'll stand with me, we'll be dismissed because we're going to have a men's prayer meeting in just a minute. <laughs> Dear Lord, how many of you men do those things? You tell your wife she's pretty. You tell your wife that she's got nice clothes on. You, you better do it. If not, you need to repent. You need to repent. But if your wife came to you and said, stop telling me these things, and, and my wife said that to me, because if you don't stop doing these things, if you don't quit being good to me, if you don't stop loving me, if you don't stop caring about me, if you don't stop intermingling in my life and complimenting me and doing good things for me, it, it might cause me to be unfaithful to you. So, so you see, there's, there's this huge misunderstanding that if we preach too much grace and we tell people how good God is and how much God loves you and how much God is committed to you, we think people are going to sin more. No, that's not the thing. You see how foolish that is and how misunderstanding that can be? Listen, when someone feels loved and someone feels accepted, it empowers strength and it empowers commitment. When they feel like they're a part of and they belong, it's only when they don't feel loved and they don't feel accepted that the temptation to find those things exist. So we got to look at it and we got to understand what grace is and we got to know that grace is not something that empowers you to go out and say, well, I've got God's grace. I can do anything I want to do. I can live any way I want to live. I can commit any kind of sin I want to commit and I'm just under grace. And so grace says that I'm all good and grace says that I'm going to heaven regardless and grace says that I'm forgiven so God knows I'm going to fail. God knows I'm going to make a mistake and so I can just do whatever it is I want to do. No, grace does not not empower us to sin. Grace empowers us to overcome the sin and the temptation that the enemy tries to put on our lives. If we say you're saved until you make a mistake, until you have a failure, until you do something wrong again, on the other hand, we, we, can, we can say that, then we're, we're telling people that God only loves us and only accepts us when we're living in perfection. And so there is, a, there is a divided line, many times denominational lines. Hello? Denominational lines that, that preach one thing and preach the other thing. And then we get to this whole idea and this concept that if, if you make one mistake, God doesn't care for you anymore and God doesn't accept you anymore. And I just want to give you a little, for your information, or FYI, you can't live that good. You can't live that good. Now, I know we, we think some people do. Here's the biggest misconception of everybody that's called themselves a Christian, that every elderly person that's residing in a nursing home is saved. And you know why we think that? Because they're old. They're old and they can't do anything wrong. How could they possibly have sin in their life? It's easy because they're human and they make mistakes. And sometimes those things happen. And I want to tell you this morning, no matter where you are or what you've done, God desires one thing above anything else, and that one thing is you. 
God wants you. God loves you. He wants you. He's passionate about you. He's head over heels in love with you. And it's not up to you to figure it out. It's up to you to accept it. And that's it. So let me say it again. Grace doesn't empower us to sin. It empowers us to overcome sin. Now, in the last two, and that's, that's, that's down to the last two. Now, that brings us to the last two. I want us to look at the last two points in the eyes or in, in the resemblance, if you will, of the older brother. Because all of these other points, all these other truths have been talking about the younger son. But what about the older son? What about him? Who is he? What has he done? He, he did the opposite of the younger son. He, he did just the opposite of the younger son. But he was just as messed up as the younger son was. See, it's amazing. When we start looking at this older son versus the younger son, the, remember what I told you at the beginning of this series, the younger son strayed, the older son stayed. And so there's a, there is a vast difference there but the problem was not one left and one stayed. The problem was that they were both out of fellowship with the Father. Both of them lacked a fellowship with their heavenly Father or with their daddy. And that's what happens a lot of times in the church. Listen to Luke chapter 15, verses 25 through 29. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Watch this now. <clears throat> Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. Let me just stop right there and tell you that no matter where you are, your father will come to you. The younger son was trying to come home, and his father ran to him. The older son is outside of the party and angry and the father still went to him. Can I get an amen? amen? But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years. This is what he was saying. Hold up, man. Lo means Bible talk. Hold up means wait a minute. Amen. Are y'all with me this morning? You know it's raining outside, right? And probably if you're thinking about when we're going to get out of here, I'm praying right now, God, send us a downpour. Just as soon as somebody tries to leave, downpour, so we got to stay. Amen. That's good preaching. <laughs> Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. Remember what I told you a few weeks ago. He always kept the law, tried to live by the law, tried to make it by the law. He was controlled by the law, but he couldn't keep the law. And the law had nothing to do with the love of the Father. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friend. Defining truth number 11. Write this down. Growing in faith causes depletion in friends. Growing in faith causes depletion in friends. Now, I'm going to get off my notes just a minute and I'm going to tell you this. Sometimes people that are your friends are only your friends when the weather's good. They're only your friends when you can do something for them. They're only your friends when you're doing what they want you to do. And when you have friends that are causing you to be out of fellowship with the Heavenly Father, you got to have a depletion of friends. You got to get rid of some friends. <clears throat> On a personal note, personal testimony. When I got saved, I'm talking about I got saved. I decided I was going to live for the Lord to the best of my ability. I was going to do what God had called me to do no matter what it was. If it was working in a horse stable, cleaning out the stable, no matter what it was, God, I'm yours. I sold out to the Lord. I'm not saying I've been perfect. I knew there were three amens coming. And I'm not saying you got to go investigate how imperfect I was. Because <laughs> well, if you do, I'm going to investigate you. Amen. 
But what I'm saying is this, when I told the Lord, Lord, I am sold out to you. There were some friends, and I'm talking about good friends, that didn't see the value of being dedicated to the Lord and didn't see the value of being sold out to the kingdom and didn't see the value of laying down some of the things that I was doing with them. I had to tell them that I can't hang out with you anymore. Let me just stop and tell you something. There are some friends you may have that if you're not influencing them and they're influencing you, that is the first indicator that that friendship needs to be a distant relationship. Now, the wrong friends will keep you in the field and out of the Father's house. The wrong friends will keep you in the field. That's where this son was at. He was in the field, out there with his friends. The older son's friends were probably saying things like, your father's so lucky to have you. Man, has anybody ever told you that in church? Anybody ever said that in church? That preacher ought to be so glad you're there. That, that sister, that brother ought to be so glad you chose to sit with them. They ought to be so glad you chose to do it. No, 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 no. Listen, friends like that are not friends. It'll cause a depletion in friendship when you grow in Christ. And I, I can hear his friends saying things like, boy, you ain't nothing like your brother. Your old ragged brother, he left. He blew all that money, and here you are. You're doing all the right stuff. You ain't nothing like your brother. You stayed right here and you've worked. You've done a great job. Every time your daddy turned around, he had to be thinking about the son that was out there doing what he was doing. But boy, when he looked around and saw you and saw what you were doing, how amazing are you? You're just a great son. You ought to be honored in every way. Everything ought to be done for you. And in today's church, in today's church, I think it would sound something like this. Look at you. You've tithed. You've attended church. You fast. You read the Bible. You pray. You roll your sleeves up and you go to work at the church and you all do all this. You ain't missed church in 25 years. Boy, you something else. You, you just something else. And the reality was the older son was as much out of fellowship with the father when he was in the field as the younger son was out of fellowship with the father when he was in the pig pen. Out of fellowship is out of fellowship. It doesn't matter where you are. It's kind of like being dead. It really don't matter once you're dead how you got there, you're dead. It doesn't matter. And it's like being out of the fellowship with the Father. If you're out of fellowship with the Father, it doesn't matter how you're out of fellowship. What matters is getting back in fellowship. You know, I dare say that most altar calls, and I'm guilty of this, I dare say that most altar calls are from the perspective of the younger son, right? I mean, think about it. This is what it sounds like. If you stand to your feet all over the house and bow your heads, every eye closed, every, 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 every head bowed, and no one looking around. This is for those that, that if you strayed from the Father, if you're strayed from the Lord, if you're backslidden, if your life is a mess, if you're bound by alcohol and drugs and destructive things in your life, if you're living in the pig pen, it, the, these altars are open for you. Come and fall before the Lord and repent. And, and, and do what things you need to do to, to get right with the Lord and make sure everything's good. And there's nothing wrong with that. There are people in the pig pen that need to come to the Lord. But listen, how many altar calls have we ever heard? How many altar calls have pastors ever given from the per perspective of the older son? What if it sounded like this? Have you ever heard an altar call being done like this? What if it was like this? If you're a good person, if you don't drink, smoke, or cuss. My wife years ago was working in children's church and we were youth pastors and the pastor's son had a prayer request and he was about six or seven years old. He raised his little hand. She said, what is it? What is it, Josh? And he said, I'll pray for my daddy. Now he's the pastor of the church. Pray for my daddy. He drinks, smokes, and cuss. My wife said, now Joshua, she said, he does, he does. But think about, think about an altar call that said, if you're a good person, 
If, if, if you've tied every check you've ever got, you tied on your tax refund, you tied on somebody that gave you $20 for, at a yard sale, you, t- you prayed, you pray every day, you worked in the church, you never drank, smoked, or cussed, you never done none of those things, and these altars are open for you. What about that kind of altar call? Listen, if we're not careful, we'll begin to think that we did something to merit the grace of God. Now, you're quiet this morning. If we're not careful, we will get in such a mindset that we will have a relationship with the Lord, but we'll fail to have fellowship with the Lord, and we will think because we've done something, and we've been this, and we've done that, that somehow we merit, we have worked enough to get the grace of God. Listen to what Isaiah said in Isaiah 64 and 6. When we display our righteous deeds, we are nothing but filthy rags. Listen to what David declared in Psalms 14 and 3. No one does good, no, not one. And then Paul announced in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. My friend, listen to me this morning. If you think that your good deeds gives you access to God, then you are just as lost as the ones who think their bad deeds keep them from God. You better give the Lord some praise this morning. Listen to what God said in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. He was talking to Adam and he told Adam specifically, he said, you may eat freely from the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. And we, if we're not careful, we take the word of God like that and we, we hinge on it and we live in it and we hold on to it and we say we, we just got to be careful that we can't touch that. We can't touch that tree. We can't get on that tree. And if it's God's order, then it's God's order. I get that. I understand that. But listen to me. We spend too much time under the tree of legalistic stuff and under the tree of commands of, of, of men and churches and denominations and we spend too much time under that tree and not enough time under the tree called Calvary where Jesus bled and died and gave his life for sin. It's at that tree called the cross that we find mercy and grace. It's not at the tree that was in the Garden of Eden. It's in the tree. It's in the tree called Calvary. It's that place that the blood of Jesus Christ flowed from his body and run out on that tree and poured out on that ground. It was there where Jesus bled and died for me and you. That's where grace came into play. That's where grace and mercy started. I'm not dwelling under the tree of legalism. I want to dwell under the tree of grace and mercy so that when I know that I've failed, I know I have an advocate with the Father. You see, we need to stop elevating our good and even stop elevating our bad. And we need to start elevating the one who died on the cross of Calvary, who said, I loved you when you were unlovable. I loved you when you were still sinning. I loved you when you made the mistakes. I loved you when you failed. I loved you when you were wrong. I loved you when you were doing all the things that were against me. I still died for you. Why don't we elevate him instead of our good and bad? Because it was what he did on the cross of Calvary that qualifies us to be at the party of grace at the Father's house. Nothing we done. Amen? Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise this morning. Last one. Number 12. Defining truth number 12. Write this down. Everything God has is for everyone who wants it. Everything God has is for everyone who wants it. 
Luke 15, 31 and 32. His father said to him, still dealing with the older son, look, dear son, don't you love that terminology? He still looked at him, son, you're not in fellowship with me, but I love you. You're my dear son. You're not just my son. You're not just in relationship. I want fellowship with you. Look, dear son, you've always stayed with by me. And everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Listen to me. Anger, pride, and jealousy. Anger, pride, and jealousy will keep you working in the field instead of enjoying the party of grace. Anger, pride, and jealousy will keep you working in the field instead of enjoying the party of grace. Some people are angry. Some of you in here this morning, you may be angry. It may be something in you that you're just angry about. Some people are angry because they know deep inside they can't keep the law. They've tried and they can't keep it. They, they've tried to do all the legalistic stuff and they can't do it. They, they can't keep the law. They, they tried not to be this way or they tried not to do that. And every time they tried, they got tempted and they failed. And, and, and they beat it a few times and they thought they were an overcomer on that particular thing. And all of a sudden, boom, and, and they get angry. They get angry. And the reason they get angry is because they see somebody else overcoming what they can't overcome and they get angry about it. I tried to keep the law. I tried to keep the law, God. I tried to be perfect. I tried to do it the way the kin, every, every kin person has ever told me, every person's ever told every preacher's ever told me, every evangelist's ever told me. I tried and I can't keep it all. I tried to do it right. I tried to be perfect, but I couldn't. And so I'm angry. I'm angry. Some people are prideful because they keep a few laws. And they think because they keep a few laws that qualifies them for grace. Well, God, I, I did this and, and I'm this way and I, I don't do that. And, and God, I don't that. And God, I don't this. But Lord, look what they do and look what that one did and look how they're living and look what they're saying. And, and God, I, I, but I'm here. I'm telling you, Lord, I, I kept three of the Ten Commandments and they're only keeping two. Prideful. Prideful. Some people are jealous. They're jealous because they know your history and they know what you've done and they know how you've lived and they know your mistakes and they're jealous because you still chose to have the freedom of God's grace rather than to be held captive in the field. And they're jealous. They're jealous because in the midst of all your failures, in the midst of all your mistakes, you keep going back to the Father. You keep getting up and going back to the Father. I'm telling you, those three things, anger, pride, and jealousy, will keep you working in the field when you should be enjoying the party of grace. Here's my message to those people. Put your tools down. You can't work enough to merit the grace of God. Put your tools down. You're not going to get good enough to pay for your sins. Put your tools down. You can't work that labor off. Put your tools down. You can't do enough work to earn the, 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 what the Father has for you. you. You can't do enough. Grace is ringing the dinner bell. Grace is saying, come home. Grace is saying, I'm waiting. Grace is saying, come in. Grace is saying, pull up a chair. Get your feet under the Father's table. Grab your fork. Eat from the Father's table. Enjoy the goodness of your Father because grace says, I'm not interested in what you did. I'm interested in what I can do through you and in you. Grace says, I love you just like you are, and I love you enough not to leave you that way. See, for years, for years, I looked at this prodigal son story. And I looked at that story and I said, God, that's me. That's me in the pig pen. 
That's me, God. And all of my failures, all my mistakes, all my rottenness, everything, God, I, that's me. I, I've lived this way and I, I've done this and I've done that and I'm a failure and I'm a mess up. And I, I, God, I, I just want to get out of the pig pen and I want to come back to the Father. And God, I want to pray and I want to ask you. But the whole time, once I got out of the pig pen, I thought I had it made. I thought everything was good. And this is what I've done. This is what you do. This is what I do. We put on the, the new clothes, but not the clothes that the Father gives gives us, we create our own costume. And we put on a costume that comes good with a mask. I'm not talking about one of those with a string. I'm talking about one of them that are made to fit and made to stay. And we put on all this stuff that makes everybody else think that we are so royal and so high and so close to God that we never make a mistake. We never get tempted. We never fail. And we wear those clothes around us and we put them on so tight because we don't want anybody to think that because they saw me raising my hands or saying amen or loving the Lord or being at church, we don't want anybody to think that we're a hypocrite because that's the problem most people say about church people is I don't want to go to church because the building's full of hypocrites. Yes, you're exactly right. If you're going to keep those kind of clothes on, that's what we are. But I'm telling you, God is saying, put it all down and pick up what I've given you and live for me. I've said this before, but anytime we go back to Jessup, to my daddy's in-law's house, when I walk in the door, he, of course, Faye and the girls greet him, and everybody says, hey, and hey, Papa, how you doing? Hey, Papa, how you doing? And you know what he says to me? Now, bud, I got some uh, raisin cakes up there in the cabinet, and I bought a box of cereal that you like, and the, I got a gallon of milk now, son. You just go in the kitchen and hear. I don't know why he always says it to me. <laughs> but he always tells me, here, here, here it is, son. Go, go help yourself. When Kayla got married, I, I, I was heartbroken one day after she got married. She'd come home and by our house and she said, Daddy, can I have, and she was standing in the kitchen. And I walked in there and I pointed my finger and I said, don't you ever ask me that question again. She said, what? I said, baby, I don't care if, if you married 100 years and you're 150 years old. And of course, that'd mean I'm close to 200, right? But I don't care how old we get. Don't you ever come in my house and ask if you can have anything in here because whatever's in here, you can have. You want to know why I told her that? This is daddy. This is daddy, and that's my baby, and that's my baby. So when you come in my house, you help yourself. Now, don't be getting my favorite stuff, but you help, you help yourself. You help yourself because you're in daddy's house. You're in daddy's house. They ain't got to come in and ask me if they can plop down on the couch, lay on the couch, lay in the floor, take a nap. They ain't got to ask me if they can take their shoes off or anything else. All they got to do is show up at the house. All they got to do is walk in the door. You want to know why? They're my babies. I love them and I want them to come to my house and I want them in there and I'm the father and whatever the father's got, they got. If I got it, they got it. If I got it, they got it. If I got it, they got it. And your heavenly father feels the same way about you. You you are not a lost cause. You are not a hopeless mess. You are not tore up from the floor up. You are saved by the grace of Almighty God. Jesus Christ loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And let me tell you, before you start saying, well, you're the pastor, that's the way you gotta be. No, no. Mm -mm. You see, here's the thing. Let me, let me tell you something about being a pastor. So convenient for people to say, well, he's a man just like I am, which is true. Until the pastor starts being the pastor, and then they want to say, uh-uh. He ain't going to tell me what to do. <laughs> right? Amen? Seven, seven of you agree? Amen? And you say, well, you're the pastor. That's the way you've got You've got to preach this stuff. No. For years, I wouldn't preach this and the reason I wouldn't preach this is because I thought that if I kept the facade on I could make everybody think that I was the man until people find out you're not the man or you're not the woman you can keep them fooled 
But guess who I figured out I wasn't fooling? The one that matters. My heavenly father. His son, Jesus Christ. I'm not fooling them. I'm not fooling. Hey, I can fool you, but I can't fool him. You can fool me, but you can't fool God. He sees past all that stuff. So I want to tell you something. Put your tools down when it comes to grace. Don't put them down. We got work to do. And I won't go into a whole sermon on this. And I'm not going to do a series on it that I know of right now. I may one day. But you're not going to be. The only prerequisite to being saved is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's it. How does a person get saved? Believe in their heart that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, raised on the third day, and is the Son of God. Confess it with your mouth. Believe it in your heart. Confess it in your mouth with your mouth, and you will be saved. That's what the Word of God says. But again, I'm not going to go into a series on this, but let me tell you this. You will not be judged whether or not you are a king's kid or not. That is determined whether or not your name is written in blood in the Lamb's Book of Life. But you and I will be judged by what we do. You will be judged by what you do on the day of judgment. But what you do has nothing to do with his grace. His grace has everything to do with what he did, what he did on Calvary. So put your tools down. Quit trying to think you can work your way into heaven. Quit trying to think you're that good. You're that talented. You're that wonderful. You're not. You're just a loved human just like everybody else in this world. And Jesus died on a cross for you just like he died on a cross for everybody else. He loves you the same as he loves everybody else. If somebody asks me, which daughter do you love the most? There's no way to tell. I don't love either one of them the most. Put your hand down, Kayla. That ain't true, baby. <laughs> She's just over there. It ain't worship. She's trying to get my attention. It's me, it's me. No, the truth of the matter is I love them equal. They both got qualities I like. They got qualities I don't like. They both do things I love. They do things I don't love. There's things they do that I would like to just take them by the neck in the name of Jesus and ring it like a chicken for Sunday dinner and say, what in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ were you thinking? But you know what? I'm not going to do that. You want to know why? Because my love as a father goes beyond their activity because they're, I'm their father. I love them. And Jesus Christ loves you just the same. Hey everybody, this is Pastor Bud Womack from Life Point Church here in America, Georgia. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for joining us today in this worship experience. Our prayer is that the message you've heard is relevant for your life and for today, and also that it builds the body of Christ as a whole. We'd like for you to go to our YouTube channel, click on subscribe so that you can be a part of the next messages that come out. We'd also like to give you the opportunity to be a part of Life Point Church as we continue to point people to abundant life. If you'd like to give and help support this ministry, go to our website, www.lifepointamericas.com. Click on the Give button. You'll be able to follow the steps to support this ministry.